My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for choosing us. Let's begin with education because the Ghana Education Service says they have nothing to do with people who demand or pay money to facilitate placement into schools and want parents to report such persons to the police. Addressing a news conference a while ago, Director General of the Ghana Education Service, Dr. Eric Nkansa, indicated they have strengthened the internal controls, beefing them with third-party institutions that would monitor their systems to ensure there are no abuses. A total of 372,780 students have been automatically placed in the schools they chose. However, 165,601 could not be matched to their choices and thus qualify for self-placement. Students are supposed to report to their schools on the 20th of February to go through the admission processes. Here's the Director General giving further details on the development. Preference. So the region is referring to the region of the school of choice, the school that you want to attend. Residential preference, school, then the program of choice before you click on submit. And then again, you would need to print the form and visit the school to begin the admission process. Parents and guardians are told that schools selected on the self placement portal can be changed as many times as the candidate wishes on the portal until such a time that the candidate enrolls in a school. Reopening date. Per the calendar for 2023, the academic calendar for 2023, the first year students are to report to school on February 20, 2023. So from next week, February 20, students can report to schools for registration and possible orientation for academic work to commence on February 27, 2023. Payment of monies. We strongly caution parents and guardians to be on the alert for unscrupulous individuals who may approach them to pay any amount of money for the placement of the awards. Such persons are to be reported immediately to the police and to the GES, or possibly to the TVET service for us to pick it up. We are also advising heads of all schools to stick to their approved prospectus. On the other hand, we also urge parents to cooperate with the school authorities during and after the admission process. Grievance redress mechanisms. Solution centers have been set up at all regional education offices. At the national level, the Solution Center will be set up at Nat Hall, Adabraka. I'm told the place is even ready. GES Call Center has also been set up with well-trained staff to address all concerns from parents and guardians. The call center number is 03 Zero two nine eight seven six five four. I repeat the number zero three zero two nine eight seven six five four and is a toll free number. Our social media handles are also available for individuals to report any grievances. Our staff will respond as soon as practicable. On this note, may I take the opportunity to announce that the 2023 Computerized School Selection and Placement System, CSSPS, for senior high schools and TVET schools site 
We'll be going live any moment from this minute. I would like to thank you for your attention. God bless us all. You have the Director General of the Ghana Education Service. Now, Security Analyst with the Kofi Annan International Keep, uh, Peacekeeping Center, Dr. Victor Doke, has urged the state security agencies to act swiftly to avert any clash as a new Boko chief is being installed. Join us is learning that there is an existing Boko chief from the Kusasi Gate, but has been disregarded by the Mamprugu overlord who has gone ahead to enskin a chief from the Mamprusi Gate. There's been heavy security presence since morning for the enskinment ceremony. We'll hear from Dr. Doke shortly, but first, let's go live to the Boko area and speak with Eliasu Tanko, who's monitoring events for us. Uh, Eliasu, what's the latest? Has a new chief been enskinned? Iliasu. Hello, Aita. Yes. Has the new chief been enskinned? Yes, exactly. He has been enskinned. Uh, the chief is called Na Sid Abagri Kuluga II. He has been enskinned. He's a retired educationist. Uh, I'm told that his grandfather was the fourth, the 12th Bokunaba. And as I speak to you now, the overlord of the Mamprugu traditional area. Now, Bohaka Mahami Sheriga has enskinned him, the new chief of Boko, and is a uh, wild jubilation currently in town. I'm told that the process currently ongoing to ensure that he uh, he's taken to Boko. And how are the people reacting to this development, especially as you report there was one who was disregarded by the overlord? Well, we, what the difference is that uh, the Kusasis have enskinned a chief for the Boko, and he's currently in Boko. So this is a new enskinment from the overlord of the Mount Pugu traditional area, which we know Boko is also part of the Mount Pugu traditional area. So this particular chief, there was no any um, uh, anyone that was rejected. What happened was that the Regional Security Council, we are told, uh, attempted this morning to stop the process. Uh, the regional minister visited the place and informed the overlord that uh, he had gotten a message from the president to invite him all over uh, from uh, Nalirgu to Accra. Uh, but there was a stiff resistance from the youth, and so the regional minister was made to leave the place, and the process went on. Uh, they, were, they, are, they were four, I mean, gates. Uh, that were qualified for this particular enskinment. But after the deliberation, the overlord chose uh, Na Seidu Abagare Akuluga II to be the Boko Naba. Elias, so help us to understand, I mean, a bit background into this whole enskinment, and has it got to anything to do with the recent clashes we've seen in the area? Exactly. We do know that uh, for some time now, the Mampresis have been uh, the legitimate rulers of Boko. But for the past 40 years now, when there was a dispute and the Kusasis took over uh, the Boko chieftaincy. And so this is uh, for nearly 40 years, this is the time that the Mampresis are also enskinning chiefs for the same area. What uh, usually has been the case is that the Mampresis have a regent in Boko, and that is why we've been hearing about tension over chieftaincy in that particular area. So what this means is that uh, the Kusasi has a chief, and the Mampusi also has a chief. And so uh, it, it has direct connection to what has been happening, the tension that has been happening in the Boko area. And so as we speak, uh, practically, uh, if this chief is able to escort back to Boko, it means that practically there's going to be two chiefs, one for the Kusasis and one for the Mampristis. And so that's why my understanding is that that's why the security area or the security council earlier on wanted to intervene to stop this particular incident. But as you know, the overlord is the, 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 the chief or the overlord of the area. And so he went ahead to and skin. Uh, the chief for the Boko traditional area. 
Elias Tanko is our Northeast Regional Correspondent with those details. Well, Security Analyst Dr. Victor Doke says state security must intervene to resolve the matter before it escalates, especially because of recent events in the area. You're going to have a dual chief, but the question is, the Boko Naba currently has been recognized per law. Is that same for the Bankusis? Is a new chief they have in Skint recognized by law? We all know the answer. Now, I would entreat the security services to act promptly, identify those conflict actors, the shadow actors, those stakeholders sponsoring the activity and apprehend them. They always will have a tight situation in Boko. Mm. Okay. So, so from, I mean, at this moment, from how, for how long from now should this advice from you be heeded by the security agencies? We know he's been unskinned. He'll be moving from Dalerigu to Boko. From this time on, how swift should the action be? I think, well, knowing our security services, mm. I'm sure intelligence has already been picked up from them to identify the situation at hand. And they are already in position. If not, mm. then they have to be. Now, the question is, which route is this new chief going to use to enter Boko? We are looking at how the Kusasi youth are also going to react. And let's not forget that the Kusasi youth, per my understanding and data collected, will not allow any chief, in their opinion, which is illegal, to enter Boko through any route. And we know the consequences of that. Finance Minister Ken Oforieta has expressed surprise at the continuous picketing at his office by pensioner bondholders insisting government has addressed their concerns. The group conveyed at the Finance Ministry this morning to resume picketing as it received the support of other pressure groups. Listen to the Finance Minister Ken Oforieta. It was released a couple of days ago and I thought uh, I had made it unequivocally clear that um, you know um, all government bonds will be on it and that um, therefore whether you are voluntary or not whether you have tendered or not uh, it will be respected so i really want to understand why we are still here um, so that if there's anything more i can say i can do that but really um, if you look at the press statement it emphasized the fact that this was voluntary and about 15, 16% of the pensioners actually tended, but they chose to. Um, the bulk of you did not, but I had indicated that it was voluntary, which means that we will honor those payments. What I tried to do in giving you the option was that about um, almost 80% of you have bonds that go beyond five years, from five years going. And so in the new arrangement where I have brought everything down to below, from five years down, it makes it easier to get your lump sum money faster. That's your choice. It makes it easier. Anytime you are able to get your money ahead of time is good for you. But that's really your choice. And therefore, a lot of you decided not to take it. But that was really the basis of giving you the option. But if you chose not to take the option, we made it clear that we will honor those things. So really, there is no reason for us to be sitting here. Because that assurance has been given on paper. So uh, that's why I really want to, to talk with you guys to see what it is that you are afraid of or that you think will not happen. You know, so my issue, which I told your leader, was that now you have very little of the old bond in the system. 
which means that in the event of a crisis personally, um, your ability to trade that paper in is really diminished. But that's a choice you make that, oh, I don't really care about that. I will continue holding that. And we are saying if you continue holding that, fine, government would honor those papers. So I'm a little unclear, you know, um, as to exactly what now the problem is. And I'm looking at the lady here because she keeps shaking her head. So maybe I'm not getting through and I would like her to, to, to you. The finance minister has since met the protesters privately on their concerns. My colleague James Averji has been monitoring events for us. He joins us with more. James, what was the outcome of that meeting? Hello, James. What, what was the outcome of the meeting between the minister and the protesters? Okay, Aisha, so we have learned that the minister has assured the group that he's going to have a meeting with the president to take a final decision on that matter. But we have uh, the convener of the group, Dr. Edwana Nienchi, who's been in that meeting with the minister, is here joining us to tell us exactly how the meeting went and how uh, uh, what assurances the minister has been giving them and what their reaction to that is. So, Dr. Eduan Anienchi, you said that the minister says he's going to meet with the president. Why does he have to uh, take him to meet the, uh, the president to arrive at a decision? Has he been telling you anything about that? Well, the president is the final uh, person to take these decisions. So, we have uh, laid our cards on the table. The minister has tried to explain to us, but we said we don't see any difficulty. What is the difficulty? the minister is facing? What is the difficulty this country will face when you say you have exempted pensioners from this uh, exchange? After all, our money, our, our bonds were not tendered in. Okay. So we have already self-exempt ourselves. But we are saying that was a default. We didn't like to self-exempt. We wanted the issuer to exempt us. And now the issuer must come out and tell us what is the, what, what is the consequence of any negative consequences if they are exempted from the program. We see nothing, uh, any, any problem whatsoever. Now, now, yesterday you indicated that he has granted the same uh, demands you are making to other groups. Did he tell you why your uh, uh, decision would have to be taken in conjunction with the president? No, well, he just explained that those are, were like uh, corporate ones, the pension funds and they can uh, use their funds mm. to do something as a group. So that's easier if you don't want to bring them under. You can design a package for them, but the difficulty is the individuals. If you exempt them, what? You can't treat them as that one. But we are saying that, well, the exemption, the, our money coming in under the program is, is over. The gate is closed. There's no way our, our bonds will be tended in because yeah. the, it's closed. So, there is no incentive to keep on, you know, denying us this exemption and allowing the elderly to be converging here okay. for the eighth time mm. and, 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 and counting. Has it given you any timeline on where to get back to you and are you going to parliament tomorrow? Yeah, we are going to parliament today. I, I said we were going to help him to do the right thing in parliament. When will he come back with uh, feedback from the president? I, I, I can't tell, but according to him, mm. by the time he appeared before Parliament, he might, they might have uh, resolved that issue. So you are hopeful by tomorrow you get a pronouncement? Yes, yes, that's, okay. that's, that definitely we are hoping for that. All right, so that is Dr. Eduan Anienchi explaining why the finance minister had to go meet the president before he takes a final decision on that matter. He says that by tomorrow, uh, tomorrow by the time he finishes with Parliament, we would hear whether... He is granting them their demand or not. But this afternoon at 3 p.m., they'll be going to meet the Speaker of Parliament to officially state their position to the Speaker as well before the Finance Minister meets them tomorrow. So Aisha, that was the outcome of the meeting uh, between the group and the Finance Minister. 
James Averji, there with uh, details from the Finance Ministry where the Pensioner Bondholders uh, Forum have been meeting and picketing for exemption from the debt exchange program. Well, former Chief Justice Sophia Kofu, who herself has been joining them, says Finance Minister Keno Forietta has not done a good job in managing the country's economy. Former Chief Justice Sophia Kofu. Um, she was speaking in an interview yet to be aired on Upfront. I recall is that when Ken became Minister of Finance in 2017, I heard him on the TV. He was being in, he was talking and he was saying that he sees his responsibility as being that of uh, protecting the national coffers. Now, promise, the promise and the achievement, the gap is too big and I need more explanation. I think that's it. You know, uh, I, you'll be surprised. I, I Normally, I take things, when it comes to a lot of things, I take things from their, their, their most simplified yeah. format. There's no need to, to be complex about all kinds of things. I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to be able to argue all kinds of isms and so on and so forth, no. But all I know is that you were going to protect the national coffers and, and they are now empty. The full interview airs at 6 p.m. on Art Front with Raymond Aqua. Let's do more. Have you donated in support of the classroom project yet? If not, kindly take your phone and send your donations to the Momo number 059 30 or 059-3038832. A32. The account name is Multimedia Group Limited, and for your banking transactions, it is Access Bank Ghana Limited, Castle Road, and the the account number is zero zero nine zero one zero one zero five four one nine one. The number again is zero zero nine zero one zero one zero five four one nine one zero zero nine zero one zero one zero five four one nine one the branch code is zero zero nine and the swift code is a b n g g h a c a b n g g h a c a b n g g h a c your donation will enable some 700 children in the northern and central regions to learn in a safe classroom Two communities are benefiting from this project. The first is the Breman Jamradi Basic School in the central region. Their current school block is weak and the children are eagerly waiting for your support for the new classroom block initiated by the multimedia group and its audiences with the support of Star Ghana. The facility is a three-unit classroom block with an ICT and library, a staff common room and the headmaster's office. Construction is at the roofing stage. The project currently requires more wood, roofing sheets, 150 furniture, windows, doors, tight tiles and some cash. Send in your donations now. The second project is at Zonyeli EA Primary School in Tolom in the northern region. It is also a three classroom block and a staff common room. Please send in your donations and the Momo number is 059 The number again is 059 The account name is a Multimedia Group Limited. And uh, banking transaction is at Access Bank Limited Castle Road branch. The account number is 009 1 uh, The branch code is 009 and the SWIFT code is ABNGGHAC, ABNGGHAC. Thank you for giving for change.
Let's stick with education because basic schools in the Kota suburb of Oforikrum municipality in the Ashanti region lack modern day libraries, which impedes access to quality education. The lack of study areas negatively affects the literacy level and reading habits of pupils in that community. To heighten literacy in the area, a new library and ICT center has been handed over to the Kota township. Clinton Yaboa has more in this report. Libraries, ICT centers and study areas play a vital role in supporting education and literacy, shaping new ideas and promoting creativity among school kids. However, in the Kote Township, pupils at various levels of education do not have the opportunity to enjoy these education advantages. The over 50,000 Read to Lead Library and ICT facility will provide the avenue for pupils to advance their learning and knowledge capacities. The facility has private study room, an ICT laboratory, administrative offices and music instrument chamber, alongside numerous books. Speaking at the grand opening of the library, founder of Read to Lead Foundation, Samantha Boatin, explained that she was inspired by the critical state of the educational system that gave rise to her. The facility will be equipped to provide additional services to nurture young people with soft skills. I come from a strong background of people who have been educated in the Kote education system, in the mass education system, and who have profited from it. So I wanted to give back to the community that has made me who I am today. So it just inspired me to also come back here and give back to my community. Students, if they are to come here, they're able to access not only books. Over time, we'll continue to offer courses like creative writing, dance, just things to engage students within the community. Community. Chief of Nyinehin Sokote, Nana Adubuama, was happy the facility will help improve education in the community. Education is not really valued, and with this, all communities around here will benefit. Every school kid who access this facility will forever be thankful. Ashanti Regional Director of Education, Willie Kwame Amankwa, appeared while calling on individuals to assist the government to provide quality education, employed teachers to play a supervisory role to ensure the aim of the gesture is achieved. My teachers, let today be a turning point. Take this kids as your children. And at the end of the day, 30 years from now, you see good people from Kochi. The facility is the third library in Kumasi to be established by the Read to Lead Foundation. Reporting for Joy News, Clinton, Yabwa. Deputy Majority Leader Alexander Fenyomarkin says government must urgently make the diagnosis and treatment of hepatitis B free through the National Health Insurance Scheme. Delivering a statement on the disease in Parliament, Fenyomarkin explained that this treatable disease is killing people mainly because of the cost of treatment. He urged government to cover the treatment for hepatitis B just as it is doing for HIV AIDS. As the if leading cause of liver cancer worldwide, Viral hepatitis B elimination could greatly reduce the rate of liver cancer death if only we can find it and treat millions of people who are unaware they are living with a condition. Mr. Speaker, I conclude by saying that with the World Hepatitis B Day approaching somewhere in July, government should make testing, vaccination and treatment accessible to the communities to save lives. This can be done through decentralization of the services through to make implementation of the community-based hepatitis B more effective. It is vital that the testing, diagnosis, vaccination and treatment of hepatitis B should be enrolled onto the National Health Insurance Scheme, just as it is done for those living with TB and HIV. So speaker, HIV patients get an antiretroviral drugs free of charge. Unfortunately, hepatitis B patients who also rely on this same um, medication have to buy. If we do this, 
it will reduce the mor morbidity and mortality in our country to the barest minimum. The Futu MP explained that parents are passing on this disease to their children because of the lack of an effective mechanism to deal with the situation in Ghana. Estimate from 2020 Ghana Health Service press release on World Hepatitis B Day showed that an average of 120,000 newborns will be exposed to hepatitis B virus by their mothers during delivery, and up to 90% of these newborns may end up being infected. Mr. Speaker, these newborns can affect the disease by receiving treatment with hepatitis B, HBIG, and vaccination, which is yet to be introduced by the Ghana Health Service. The cost of the HBIG is quite expensive, averaging 1,000 Ghana cities for the underprivileged women in rural areas, hence the increase of the disease to their newborns at birth. The newly elected international president of the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship International, Francis Ousu, says it is high time Christians become responsible and practice what they profess. According to him, if all 60% of Ghanaians who profess Christianity practice the tenets of the faith, which includes integrity, Ghana will develop. He's speaking in a meeting to welcome him after his election in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The Four Gospel Businessmen Fellowship International first launched in Ghana on the 9th of February 1977. Formally incorporated on 29th October 1984, it is the world's largest Christian businessmen's organization, networking thousands of members in more than 85 nations. When they just ended international directors' meeting in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, a Ghanaian, Francis Owusu, was elected the fourth international president of the fellowship, becoming the first African to hold the position. Speaking at a welcome ceremony in his honor by members of the organization here in Ghana, Mr. Owusu expressed gratitude to God for the honor done him. First of all, what I want to say is that I'm greatly humbled by this reception. But I want to give glory to God because it is only he who could have done what has been achieved. Indeed, indeed the battle is the Lord's. I went to Kuala Lumpur and I knew it was only God who could get me through because the majority of votes were non-African. But to the glory of God, many people in the other regions said that any time they prayed, they saw my name on my face. This shows that the God we serve is truly alive. Amen. And he has decided that this is the time for Africa to have its turn in this international presidency. And not just its turn, but for a purpose. Because of what he's about to do. He also called on Christians to practice the tenets of the Christian faith instead of complaining. Yes, definitely. Now, the time, there is an agency. So we should all put our hands to the wheel and double our efforts, especially in the marketplace where we belong. We are marketplace outreach. And we should make sure that the lives that we lead reflect the gospel that we preach. We should be shining stars. We shouldn't just uh, sort of uh, just talk the gospel, but we should walk the talk. Uh, this country is supposed to be majority Christian, so you cannot say uh, cor corruption is just with politicians. It's with each and every one of us. We should change our ways and stop pointing fingers. Judgment starts in the body of Christ. If we live right, majority will live right and things will move right. Commenting on the current economic situation in the country, he indicated it is obvious human efforts have failed. Hence the need for us to turn to God in prayer. As we all know, crisis is not only confined to Ghana. Uh, the whole world is in a crisis. And at this time, God is presenting Jesus as the only hope to come out of any major crisis because we've realized that human institutions fail. They are fallible. So God is giving us hope that once we put our trust in him, he himself will order our steps and take us out of any crisis that we are currently facing. There is power in prayer when people gather and they see God's face, humble themselves, repent, and for, sort of uh, ask for forgiveness. God will heal our land. Let's take a break on Joy News today. When we return, we'll bring you the very latest coming from the world of business.
Hello everyone, one welcome to the business segment on Joy News today with me, Pius Kojobaka. Inflation for the month of February has fallen to 53.6% in January 2023 from the 54.1% recorded in December 2022. That's according to latest data from the Ghana Statistical Service. According to the figures, the rise in food prices pushed the consumer price index up. However, transport inflation fell for the first time in 19 months due to the reduction in fuel prices during the period. Here's government statistician, Professor Samokob Neni. Council for Scientific and Industrial. Generally, price levels of goods and services have gone up by 53.6 relative to January 2022. Comparing this to the rate that we recorded in the month of December 2022, rate of inflation stood at 54.1%, indicating a decline of 0.5 percentage point year-on-year -year inflation for December 2022 relative to January 2023. This is the first time that in 19 months, the continuous upward increase in, in prices of goods and services has seen a reversal with a decline of 0.5 percentage point. On a month-on-month -month basis, that is between December 2022 and January 2023, prices of goods and services went up by 1.7%. This is because C CPI for the month of January 2023 stood at 165.6 relative to December 2022, 162.8. So prices of goods and services between December 2022 and January 2023 went up by 1.7%. Disaggregating this at the two major levels, that is between food and non-food inflation and between locally produced items and imported items, we saw a variation of 61.0% for food inflation relative to non-food inflation 47.9%. Now, about 14 billion cities worth of bondholders didn't participate in the domestic debt exchange program. That's a projection one will make after going through the official results of the domestic debt exchange released by the finance ministry. There is more in this report. The results show that the initial amount of 137 billion Ghana cities worth of bonds that should have been available for the offer was reduced to 97 billion Ghana cities. This should mean that about 40 billion Ghana cities worth of bonds was set aside. But can this be linked to the total amount of pension funds and other stakeholders that was set aside before the revised debt exchange program took off. Or maybe some clarity is needed here. Well, getting back to the official results provided by the Ministry of Finance, it shows that 97 billion Ghana cities worth of bonds were available for participation in the domestic debt exchange program. Now, out of this amount, 83 billion Ghana cities or bonds participated in this exchange program. But trying to reconcile the numbers, there are still some answers or clarity needed. Therefore, maybe the Ministry of Finance might have to come again on some of these issues. The statement issued by the Ministry of Finance also announced that it has extended the settlement date from February 14 to February 21, 2023. Government in the statement also noted that it is looking into a fresh request from some other stakeholders who didn't participate in this offer for another arrangement for their bonds. Now I shall be back at 1 p.m. with the marketplace. In the meantime, sports is next. That's this first now on journey today with me, Muftao Nabila Abdullah, former Black Stars goalkeeper Fatao Dauda has eulogized the Ghana Football Association for their decision to appoint Chris Hilton as the next head coach of the Black Stars. According to him, the decision of the football governing body to maintain the technical team bar Otto Ado means that the FA has got a vision of building a team capable of winning competitions. Uh, it was in the team when they went to the World Cup, even during the qualifiers. Um, now the national team, we are the Blasters, we have the same technical team. It's only 
Otaro is out. So I think they are going to continue with their philosophy. We saw where they play in the World Cup. For, for a very long time, you don't see the blaster playing a game, starting build from the back. But in this World Cup, they did it. When coach went there, when Otaro was I know they would do it because they're all from this organization. So uh, trust me, with the intelligent players that the, 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 the national team have now, young guys who are playing, running, will do well. We'll, we'll, we'll play like when we used to play football before, how people know Ghana to play. We are going back to it. And then, inshallah, you know, to win a game, you have to get a formula. The, some of the formulas are how to pass, how to press, how to defend, how to, a lot. So you have the formula, you win it is possible. Sometimes you may have the players, but you can't win trophy. Why? Because they don't use the formula. That can give you the win. You understand? So I think uh, the FA have done well by uh, 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 giving the, the, the job to uh, uh, Chris. He was here before. He didn't invite him to come here. He was happy to come and see how the structure here is. So. Good afternoon, welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News and our American music producer Raja B says the only way to break through internationally as a creative is to invest in marketing one's craft. The music producer who have worked with the likes of Jay-Z told Joy News in an interview that marketing and promotion is the way to go. Correct. Uh, I believe the same way we kind of do in the U.S. Promotion, marketing. Digital marketing plays a big role of how our artists break. Um, so I believe if you know these artists could put more money into their promotion and marketing mm. to blow themselves bigger, put themselves inside, you know, on big billboards, have a bigger social media presence, and things like that, it could help, you know, the U.S. find them because it's easy, you know, we all on the internet, we all on social media looking yeah. every day. So if it's in your face, you can't miss it. You, right. you understand? Right. Yeah. Now, the family of the late South African rapper, a.k.a. Forbes, has announced that a memorial uh, will be held in his honor. The event is expected to uh, come off on Friday, February 19, 2023, the memorial. The family noted is open to the public for those who want to join the family remember, a.k.a. It will take place at South Africa's leading event venue, Santon Convention Center at 3 p.m. South Africa time. The memorial will also be streamed on AK's YouTube platform. Following the memorial, the family will hold a private funeral ceremony on Saturday, February 18th. Uh, AK's family is also, has also thanked the public for the support they've received. Well, on that note, we end showbiz here on Joy News today. There's more showbiz news in our subsequent bulletins. Good afternoon to you, Aisha. Hello, beautiful Becky. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? How was your Valentine's it yesterday? Was great. You received any present? A lot I can share with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's our wrap of the bulletin this afternoon. My name is Aisha Brian. Log on to myjohnline.com. You get more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye. Bye.